Now the next thing that we're going to have to do is look for more species, improve our rigs, work on the functionality of it. These little plow anchors at 66 pounds apiece are easy to handle. You can handle them in a small boat. Somebody mentioned earlier you had a 21-foot boat. I'm running my LPAs out of an 18-foot boat right now and don't even have to take the barge out most of the time. I've got one little section of LPA left that I'll harvest Thursday morning, and all I've got to do is pull up two 66-pound plow anchors, the rest of the material, and go home. When I set up the first seaweed farm in the U.S. for food, I was working under two constrictions. I had a NOAA SBIR grant, and I was working under that uh, grant, uh, the um, contract with BAL Labs doing the fuel study that I mentioned earlier. And as a small startup business, I could not afford to fail because there were penalties if you failed. So I put in 2,000 pound blocks. On one side, I put in 39 of them. Well, these weren't going anyplace, and they didn't. So we succeeded for the grant, but in the, in the succeeding years, having to care for that. You, you know, the, it's too big to pull up with a small boat, it's too expensive to get a barge out there, so you really end up relying on putting a diver down every year, and the gear stays in the water year round. It wears out faster, it could, you know, it could interfere or be in people's way a little bit at least. This is my portable farm, and if you're going to grow the laminaries in the wintertime, or any other species that has a, a fairly short growing period, these portable farms are absolutely fantastic. You put them in, you take them out. I've had one in a unit with the University of New England for three years now. This was our third year. Grows beautifully, and I've been fishing four LPAs of my own now with two seasons on them, and I'm, I'm really happy with the design. It's a very simple tackle to rig, and it's very easy to get a, deploy it. This is why I can put out an LPA in uh, 20 minutes, a 400-foot LPA. You just drop the anchor. You run up to your first buoy line. You run the line through the tube that you saw, tie it off, and just back it down, and it's really nothing to it. So we've made it a lot easier to rig our farms now and a lot less expensive. When I put those 39 2,000 pound blocks out, well, I had to go hire Dan and his big truck to you know, get them from Auburn Concrete to the dock. And then I had to hire Jim's barge and we put all 39 of them on the barge, which Jim had just built, but he hadn't powered yet. So Colleen and I kicked over all 39 of those 2,000 pounders with a chain fall and a little sacrificial line. This is a much easier system to work with. New products. This is, uh, with the last company, Ocean Approved, I created that line of Blanche Fresh products, at, uh, fre uh, Fresh Frozen, and it culminated with a smoothie cube, a puree. And this, the frozen, like the dried, are very good products, but some people still get them lost in the freezer a little bit. So I came up with the idea of what would people have in front of them all the time so they'd really start using it on a regular basis like they need to, and that's kelp puree. It's shelf-stable. It, all of a sudden, I don't have to worry about where it is in the grocery store because I don't have to worry about refrigeration or freezing. All of a sudden, I can put this right over with the dried seaweeds where people have been looking for seaweed forever. These are the little things that you pay a lot of dues to learn and figure out. And this product is going great guns. It's refrigerated after open. So it's sitting right there with your mayonnaise, one of the many things it mixes well with. Uh, you can mix it in with any sauce that you like. You can mix it into the desserts you've seen. Product innovation is one of the keys to this, and that's something I've been as big on as, as designing farms, is actually coming up with new product lines and ways to eat it. Ways to eat it that you don't have to change the way you cook. You don't think, well, I'm not having sushi tonight, I can't have seaweed. It's like, hey, I'm having my favorite clam, white clam sauce over pasta, Woohoo! I'm having a cup of hot tomato soup for lunch, it goes in beautifully. So it's a really easy, effortless way to add it to your diet on a regular basis, and that's where the health, health benefits come in, but also, if we're going to see the socioeconomic benefits of this, we've got to be able to sell it. There's no sense farming it if we can't sell it. Product diversification. This is fucus. Most people in the United States, very few people in the United States eat fucus. Guess what? It's real popular in Europe. And it's absolutely delicious. This is actually in its reproductive stage, which is why I've taken these pictures. I've actually been working with propagating this. Uh, there are some questions. Uh, Bob Vardis did a bunch of studies with the fucoids early on. And Supposedly, they're real slow growing. But I don't know what slow growing compared to what might be. If you really just want the beautiful, sweet little tips, well, you know what? S grow, uh, slow growing might be OK. It's, if it takes uh, ASCO three years to get this big, and you only need it this big, well, hey, maybe you can get there in six or eight months. The, also, the other thing this gives is a year-round source of raw material, which is a huge advantage uh, with the seasonality of the sugar kelps that we're farming now, you've got to get everything done in a two or three month window. So we're working on expanding that window. And we're not working just with the fucoids, 
uh, we're working with reds and we're working with some greens also. This is delts, and we've been playing with farming delts on, uh, in, a, in several different methods and different styles. And we're working with, uh, trying to work a little bit with nori right now. That's the product they make the uh, sheets out of for the sushi bars, Pafira, labor. And so we're doing a lot of work in the lab still. It's not over. I work a lot with the University of New England. I work with Bigelow Labs. And I kind of get a chuckle out of it because like, I'm a high school dropout. And I'm hobnobbing with all these PhDs. And they've taught me a lot. And we're really making some really good product uh, process, uh, progress on things like papyrus seed, on the, uh, getting the adults started. And so you know, with the ultimate goal being of more diversified product lines, but also with having raw materials available year round, because the other bottleneck that we get into is production facilities, and there are only so many production facilities in Maine right now, and that, that drives what you're going to get for your product. The more, the more demand there is, the higher the price is going to be. Site selection is just everything. And if you're working in your home waters, of course, you have an advantage to start with right away. You already know. You're out there year-round. You know who's where. You know what they're fishing, how they're fishing it, when the gear moves, where the gear moves. You also know things. You want to look at currents. One of the things I was taught early on when I went, started into aquaculture in the 90s was look for a place in the wild where it grows good if you're going to grow something. You want to talk about a great indicator. Yeah, it's not rocket science. The whole procedure at the DMR can be a little bit daunting, getting going with that first lease or two on the applications. The LPAs have made that easier because that is, the LPAs are fairly simple, and then you get your feet wet and you got a feel for it. When you start going for a four-year experimental, it starts to be quite a bit of data that you have to uh, gather up, and you've really got to have it together across the T's and dot the I's, because I tell you, they will send it back every time there's a single I that hasn't been dotted. That said, after you get the first couple under your belt, you get a better feel for it. And it also, after a couple of hearings, you start learning to kind of adjust if you need to a little bit, whether it be where your sights are, what your gear appears like on the surface. There's several different things that become apparent after you've gotten the first couple in. And that's where the LPAs are nice. They're not too expensive to apply for. You can get them in real time. It can take six months to a year to get a four-year experimental lease, they say, which it's a year, year plus most of the time. It can take up to t two years to get a 10-year lease. That's yeah, a long time in a business plan to go, okay, I'm going to have my farm, I'm going to put my farm in in two years, year, two years before crop. That is one of the other beauties of seaweed is you have crop fairly quick. As in baby spinach, the, the little juveniles are delicious. You're not going to get the, the mass, the bulky one out of them, but there is actually some marketable stuff fairly early if you want to take that route. Working with the scientists, we're working on everything from water quality to water clarity, current studies, trying to put this all together. Not all sites grow seaweed the same. I have, I put in four farms that are within sight of each other, and two of them are fairly close together and grow almost identical. The other two grow quite different, and these are all within two miles of each other, and by line of sight, you can see all of them. One of the ones I thought was going to grow the biggest, the fastest, grew the slowest. It was in a real high nitrogen area. Um, I'm on the board of directors with the Friends of Casco Bay, and we've been mapping nitrogen data in Casco Bay forever. And I went, hey, look at this hot spot, man. A lot of food there. I'll try it there. And something, I don't know if it was the fresh water lens because it was close to the presumpskit. I don't know if the current was just, the current's a little bit lighter there. We're going to have to do some more studies, but I didn't get the growth I expected. Early studies or early practice. Now, remember I mentioned earlier with the seaweed you saw on the first farm, the spores swim. Well, guess what? These don't. These sink. So now you can't put them in the dark settling tube like I've done in the past. You've got to figure out a whole new way to get them to go to a substrate, which nobody's ever done because nobody's ever farmed them. I did get them to go to the substrate. I have gotten them onto a substrate now, which is the string that you put in the ocean then. But I, can't, I haven't got it to the point where they're consistent yet. We'll be working on that right through the summer again. But this is something that could be grown year round. And so that gives you a whole different set of criteria when you go looking for a lease space. If you know it's going to be in year round, well, that's different than putting one in for six or seven months. Uh, with the laminarias, we can get away with putting them out in October and pulling them in May and having any, up to 10 pounds a foot. Machinery. I won't tell you what this machinery is. Some of you might know what it is, but you can't run down to the restaurant supply store. I was in one today and say, hey, man, I need some new seaweed cutters. 
And seaweed doesn't cut easy, and all of them have different taxonomy shapes, weights, sizes, viscosities, and so what will cut one seaweed won't cut another. Some of the things I've used are absolutely ridiculous. When I first started my first frozen seaweed product, it was kelp noodles cut right out of the middle of a nice sheet of beautiful sheet of laminaria, and I was using a little hand crank pasta cutter. Then I went big time, got a motor for that, and I got up to three pounds an hour at that point. I had a guy doing some welding for me, and he walked into the shop one day, and he went, you're not going to make any money. Uh-uh, not going to happen. Then I got two Italian ones. Man, these were big cutters. They were really cool. Oh, boy, guess what? European currents and voltages are different than ours. About four buck transformers later, we had, that thing, we had those things running beautifully. And so it's not always easy. And, but to me, that's a lot of the fun of it, is the development side of it, and then watching the new products at market. This is at a friend of mine's restaurant in South Portland, the Bridgeway. Just a classic fried haddock, french fries, coleslaw. See that green tint on the haddock? That's that kelp puree. And so all of a sudden, you've added some umami pop, some nice flavor. We all like fried stuff, but everybody tells us too much fat. 75% more efficient at removing the bad fat. So it's not the... It's not a silver bullet, but it's a step in the right direction. And then you can even go to dessert. Works great in carrot cake. You can use the puree in the batter, or you can shred, uh, shred kelp in about 50% with the carrot. There's a whole bunch of different ways to add it in and have a lot of fun with it. But one thing to remember, if you're going to be a kelp farmer, at least the kelps we're farming now, it is cold in the wintertime. Yeah, and that's it. I think it will keep the top, uh, but like I say, it's a small enough group here that I'm willing to field any questions on any, any aspect of the things I've talked about.